Hello everyone and welcome to the Game Engine programming series where we write a game engine from scratch. We saw in the last video how the shader compilation is moved to the engine DLL project and that it now has a new function that can compile shader code that's already loaded in memory. We want to use this function from the editor in order to compile our material shaders. The editor can't call this function directly but we can use it in an API function that is exported by the engine DLL and therefore can be called by the editor. Let's look at the changes and additions to engineapi.cpp. Here I added the header files that we are going to need. We don't need anything from the engine for shader compilation alone. However, as we'll see in a minute, I went one step further and also added functions that upload and unload compiled shaders to and from the engine. In order to do that, we need to include the content to engine header. Tools Common has a function for converting to white string formats, and IOStream contains the blob stream reader and writer. We use this data structure for exchanging data between the editor and the engine DLL. We pass the shader source code in a buffer which this variable points to. The length of the buffer is given by the code size variable. Other inputs to the compiler are the shader type, shader function's name, and the extra compiler options. The output of the compilation is written to another buffer pointed to by this variable. As the variable's name suggests, the buffer will contain the bytecode if the compilation was successful, the error messages if there were any errors or warnings, the shader assembly code and the hash code, which obviously are only included if shader compilation was successful. These variables will contain the length of each segment within the buffer and maybe zero if the segment contains no data. We use shader group data to send the compiled shaders to the engine. As I explained in this video, a shader group contains variations of a shader. At the moment, the only shader with variations is the vertex shader that can be used for different vertex formats. The data variable points to a buffer that contains an array of compiled shader data. We'll have a closer look at this a bit later in this video. In engineapi.cs, we see the C -sharp versions of these structures. We've been using this method of sharing data between c -sharp and C++, for example, for importing textures and meshes, so I'm not going to explain it here again. Going back to the C++ code, everything after this function is new, so we can just look at the actual code in engineapi.cpp. As I mentioned earlier, I added functions for loading and unloading shaders. The add shader group function takes a pointer to shader data. I apologize for the unfortunate naming here, but I'm referring to the data pointer within the shader group data structure. This pointer contains an array of keys, which will be used to select the correct shader from the shader group. For example, in case of the vertex shader, the vertex format enumeration is used as the key for selecting the shader that can handle that format. Following the keys is an array of compiled shader data. We saw in the previous video the function that packs this data in a binary buffer. As I explained in that video, we don't include errors and assembly information when we send shader bytecode to the engine. We use the add shader group function from the content namespace to send the shader to the engine. This function takes an array of pointers to shader blocks the number of shader blocks and a pointer to the array of keys. We used the blob stream reader to go through the buffer and set our pointers before calling this function, which will return an ID. We can give this ID to remove shader group later in order to unload it from the engine. Next, we have a function that calls the code in shader compilation to compile the shader. It doesn't interact with the engine, but only compiles the shader and sends the results back to the editor. It takes a pointer to the shader data which is provided by the editor. It's used for both the input and output of the data. The function returns an integer value that indicates whether it was successful or not. Using the shader data, we set the function name and shader type, 
and construct an array of white strings containing the extra compiler options. Then we call compile shader function from shader compilation.cpp with the shader information and a pointer to the source code. This will return a block of memory that contains the results. Note that here we do want the assembly and errors to be included in the buffer by setting this parameter to true. In order to return the results to the editor, we have to read this memory block twice. The first time we read the size of each segment and set the corresponding member in the shader data. We also calculate a buffer size that only contains the bytecode, error messages and the assembly code. Using this buffer size, we allocate another block of memory that can also be accessed by the editor. Then we read the compiled shader memory block a second time and copy the data, but this time we skip the data sizes. That's everything new in enginepi.cpp. As I mentioned before, we are getting DirectX shader compiler using a NuGet package. Here we see the changes to the project file as a result. There is also a new file added that contains the package information for all installed NuGet packages. At this point we discussed everything that was added to the code in engine DLL project. We can move on to the editor's code to see how the new functions are used. In enginepi.cs I already showed the new data structures for shader data and shader group data. I defined a type alias for integers that represent an ID that is returned by engine functions. This makes it more clear which return values are IDs. Here we also import the new API functions that are exported by engine DLL. The first one is add shader group, which takes the shader bytecode of a compiled shader and uploads that to the engine. As we often do with imported functions, we don't always call them directly, because we have to somewhat prepare the data before sending it over to the C++ side. Here we need to convert the shader group to shader group data. This class is a representation of a shader group in the level editor. We'll look at this class a bit later. It has a pack for engine method that returns a byte array which contains the shader data in the format that is expected by the engine. Looking back at the C++ implementation, we can see exactly what the format of this data should be. After getting this byte array, we allocate memory for the engine to read from and copy the byte array to that memory location. Finally, we call the imported function that adds the shader group. We don't have to wrap the remove shader group function, since it only takes an ID to remove the shader group from the engine. The last imported function is compile shader. Again, here we have to wrap the function in order to process its input and output. The wrapper function uses an instance of shader group. Like I said, we'll look at this in a minute. Since this is a shader group, it means that it can contain multiple variations of a shader. Therefore, it has an array of bytecode buffers, an array of error messages, and an array of shader assembly code, one for each compiled shader. We clear all these arrays before we start. Similar to what we did for adding compiled shaders to the engine, we used the same data type, which is shader data, but this time we have to provide the source code for compilation. We do this for each one of the shader variations that we can determine from the extra arcs. We get the source code from the shader group, which is a string. However, we send it as a byte array, so we need to convert the string into a byte array. We also put the compiler options in a single string and separate them using a semicolon. Next, we copy the source code in the byte array to a memory block that we allocate here, and finally call the imported function to compile the shader. As we saw in the previous video, this will return a buffer with segments for the compiled bytecode, errors, shader assembly, and the hash code. It also returns the size of each segment in the corresponding member of the shader data. From this we can allocate a byte array and copy the data.
Then for each segment, if the size of it is larger than zero, we copy that segment and add it to the appropriate array in the shader group. Otherwise, we add an empty array or an empty string. So first we copy the bytes code. Then the error messages, if any. Then the shader assembly code. And finally the hash code. This is all we have to do in order to compile a shader and get back the results. And also that's everything that was added to engineapi.cs, except here I updated a few more ID types. As I promised, we'll look at the shader group class next. This is in a new c -sharp file that's called shader.cs. Since it's completely new, we can look at the actual code in this file. We are going to work with shaders here, so I added the same flags and shader types that we use in C++. Then we have the shader group class, which has a private class for keeping track of uploaded shader groups. We are not going to use it in this episode, but I'm going to explain it in the next video. So for now let's forget about this part. The shader group class resembles the shader data class that we used in engineapi.cs, but since it can contain more than one shader, it has an array of bytecode, errors, and so on. Also, there is a list of integers that are used by the engine as a key in order to select the correct shader from the group. When a shader group is uploaded to the engine, its ID is kept in the content ID member variable. We can determine the number of shader variations from the number of keys. We also assert that all arrays have the same size. There is a method for writing the data to a binary buffer for saving, and another one for reading the data from a binary buffer, which happens when we are loading a material asset file. These are pretty straightforward, so I'm not going to explain them in detail, but do pay attention to the order and types of the data that are read or written using these functions. There is a private method for writing only the part of the data that's needed by the engine. This method is also called by the toBinary method that we just looked at. The public overload of this method creates a binary writer and calls pack for engine to write the data. Then it copies the buffer to a byte array and returns it. There are two more methods for uploading and unloading the shader group. These will simply call the static methods in uploaded shader group class to send the data to the engine or tell the engine to remove a shader group. I'm going to start the next video with going through and explaining this class. This is therefore the end of today's video. Thank you as always for watching and I'll see you next time.